ELSL. We have witnessed the first lockdown measures due to pandemic in January when Hubei province closed its borders. This limitation on mobility became the trend for over 170 countries affected by COVID-19, including the Philippines, which implemented its own stay-at-home stay policies in March 2020. Philippines then progressed to have the longest and one of the most stringent lockdown measures in the world. Since then, Filipinos and the rest of the global community increasingly longed for fresh air from open and public spaces. In addition, the public the active transport and personal mobility equipment have become of extreme importance as public transportation ceased to operate as part of the government efforts to restrict the movement of its people. In this pandemic, the value of open spaces and mobility have been underscored and have been seen from a much more critical light. We welcome you to today's session, Walk the Talk, Mobility and Access to Parks and Open Space in the New Normal. In today's discussion, we will talk about how the pandemic has affected our mobility and use of public and open spaces, including the opportunities for us designers and citizens to uh, such pandemics. To open our today's affair, please welcome Dr. Grace C. Ramos, the Dean of the University of the Philippines College of Architecture with her wel welcoming remarks. Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to another opportunity to be transported to another realm that is far wider, far more interesting than the enclosed spaces that we are now in. It would truly be refreshing to hear about parks and open spaces as we are in our confined uh, spaces. And definitely interesting to hear about mobility and access as we wonder how far we can physically travel in the next two to three years. As we all wonder how life will be, especially in the cities, let these webinars that we have been offered in the last two months allow us to imagine how we can be part of the enabling process that we as designers will be tasked with. We keep hearing that we, we will be literally uh, stepping into a new world and we hope to be very proactive in co-defining that world instead of us merely adapting and following where the virus will lead us. The challenge ahead involves us designers thinking of ways to intervene to make the transition process a discovery process as well. It's a process that will lead to new design practices and new design products. For now, let's take in the loads of knowledge that we are fortunate to be exposed to. You're all encouraged to participate in the discussions that will follow the presentation by our esteemed colleague who always finds time for our college, our students. Thank you. And thank you too to the, and congratulations in advance to the Environmental Landscapes Studio Laboratory for organizing this already sixth webinar on environmental landscapes theme. Good morning to all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grace, for the uh, insightful welcome. Uh, before we continue, uh, let's, uh, let me just reiterate the house rules. So Zoom participants should mute their audio and turn off their videos to not disrupt the, the presentation and regarding asking questions, please use the chat box uh, in this Zoom uh, uh, window or in the YouTube uh, streaming. Our speaker for today completed his Bachelor of Science in Architecture and Bachelor of, of Landscape Architecture degrees at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. He received a master's degree in urban a uh, degree from the National University of Singapore, earning the Singapore Institute of Architecture's Book Award for his academic performance. He formed PDAA Partners in 1982, which specialized in site planning and landscape architecture and became the head of PGAA, Creative Design in 2004. 
He is a registered and licensed environmental planner and landscape architect. For his professional accomplishments, he was named Outstanding Professional of the Year in Landscape Architecture in 2002 and selected among the top uh, 10 professionals in all fields with the PFPA Excellence Award in the Philippines in 2009. In 2015, he was awarded the Gawad CCP Paris Sassining in Architecture and Allied Arts. His advocacies are in heritage conservation along with public parks and open space. Without further ado, please welcome landscape architect and environmental planner, Paolo G. Alcazarin. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dean Grace, uh, Dr. Napi, um, I'm Zeni for the invitation to the Environmental Landscape Studio Lab presentations uh, for this morning. And uh, good morning to everyone out there. I hope you're all uh, safe and well. Let me share my screen. Are we good? Can somebody confirm, please? Yes, uh, sir. OK. So good morning, everyone. Uh, this, today we will walk the talk uh, and discuss landscape architecture and urban design for mobility and access to open space. I'm Paolo Alcazarin, head of uh, PGA Creative Design. We're planners, urban designers, and landscape architects. This is the reality we are in today, free, uh, uh, pre-COVID and now during, even during COVID and in, even in post-COVID uh, times, probably next year, this is what we're facing. Traffic is just a symptom, of course, of a lack of comprehensive uh, transport system in all of our cities and towns. And we have to address this in order to be able to move, get access to where we want to go, and to get back to at least some sort of normalcy um, in post-COVID times. But the situation has always been there and we had a lot of uh, time to address it and we have not. We've tried several uh, solutions to the symptom of traffic and one of them is of course uh, uh, carpooling, but of course in the Philippines this is carpooling because we have not addressed our uh, problems of flooding also, which is part of the bigger problem of lack of comprehensive planning and land use in the Philippines. But seriously, what we have to remember in terms of uh, access and mobility is that we start and end all of our commutes by walking, yet we invest very little in infrastructure for pedestrians and bicycles. But how can we walk when uh, our sidewalks are used by, for other things other than walking. They're used as parking for tricycles. I long for a city where uh, SUVs have more rights, uh, SUVs, uh, pedestrians have more rights than SUVs. Even trucks are parked on our sidewalks. And that uh, requires all of our children to take alternative means of transport uh, like this or this, and uh, no, note that because of the time required to get to the schools, they're doing their homework while riding. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's the girls who are doing their homework and the boys do not. Our uh, sidewalks are used for commerce when it should be free from the commerce of man. They're used for uh, markets and food stalls. Here we have, uh, McDonald's, but in front of it, we have McDonald's. And you cannot report this uh, flagrant violation of, uh, of uh, the sidewalk to the police because the police themselves are on the sidewalk. You can't report them either to the barangay because the barangay is also on the sidewalk, or in this case, the street corner or canto. Uh, this is one of the things I miss from our sidewalks, although it's blocking the sidewalk somewhat. It uh, uh, provides uh, a means for a relief, at least for the men. Uh, but th this was removed after Bayani Fernando uh, disappeared from the MMDA. 
And this is what replaced it, of course. I prefer the previous one, even though it's pink. And uh, the other thing about our pedestrian infrastructure, if we build it, is that uh, you have to train as a mountain climber to be able to get cross our streets. They're so uh, biased against uh, people with disabilities and seniors like myself. And I call our sidewalks Poland because of the presence of all the poles, 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 poles. There's no place for pedestrians at all. Jesus Christ really is what you can exclaim because even Jesus Christ is on the corner. Uh, I call this block Nazarene because uh, it's on every block. And if it's not the uh, block Nazarene, it's uh, Mother Ma Mama Mary. This is Our Lady of Pricas and the Nuestra Señora de Rejas. So people have to walk on the sidewalk because of um, all of our religious requirements. But if you don't believe in God, the Avengers are also on the sidewalk. And if you notice, this is the Avengers car wash for cars again and not for people. So these are our corners. They are disabling. You, we provide water sports for PWDs. And you will become a PWD if you try to cross this barrier. And this is a reverse thing. I mean, we, the, the uh, designers here provided for PWDs, but normal people cannot even access the sidewalk. And I can't even understand what, what happened here. Uh, there's no co coordination at all between the uh, designers of the park, the pro providers of the sidewalk, and those uh, at the street, for the, uh, responsible for the street for the zebra stripes leading to a wall. I can't even cross. So the, really what, what uh, you can do is we need to ask why. Why is our uh, urban design so bad? And we do have to address all of this if we need to, uh, to provide for the first and last mile of any commute, and that is by walking. After a decade of uh, giving these talks, we've been able, I've been able to convince some LGUs and, uh, and clients uh, for pedestrian and non-motorized transport system improvements. And uh, this morning we'll present uh, some case studies of uh, proof of concept that it can be done uh, in Makati, in Taguig, in uh, Pasig City, both in the modern district CBD and the Poblacion, uh, in Manila in certain portions, uh, Rizal Park, Intramuros, some uh, proposals, unfortunately not all of which have been implemented. Of course, the most uh, successful implementation of uh, interventions have been in Iloilo and will show some possible uh, projects in Quezon City uh, currently on hold because of the pandemic. We start with the Makati CBD pedestrianization and open space improvements, a collaboration between the uh, Maseya, the Makati Association of Commercial Establishments, uh, which are the business owners that include Ayala and Makati City. Makati in the 60s uh, was planned really as a uh, single spine with buildings and the two villages behind it, Legaspi village and Salcedo village, villages were supposed to be residential, but, but because of the success of uh, the CBD, it's filled with buildings. And this is it, uh, Makati CBD after about uh, 15 years in, in the 1980s and uh, access between uh, Salcedo and Legaspi villages uh, had become already difficult because everyone was dependent on the car. And so uh, by the 1990s, it took between 20 to 30 minutes to cross from Legaspi to Salcedo village uh, because of the dependence on cars to uh, access either side and traffic of course uh, became unbearable and uh, and a study was conducted uh, by Maseya with the assistance of Ayala to determine uh, what was wrong. And uh, one of the main considerations was the lack of pedestrian access. The whole length of Ayala Avenue, which is two kilometers, had only three points at which it could cross. 
uh, and that was because uh, they all had figured a lower density for the entire development. So a retrofit had to be put in. And so we were called in uh, PDAA landscape architects in the late 90s. And since then, it's been 20 years we've been involved with Masaya in uh, pedestrian improvements. Uh, this is Legazpi Village. And this is Salcedo Village. We started with a, a survey and audit of all of the sidewalks in the late 90s. And my, I, I myself, with the, uh, with the collaboration of uh, Mam Zeni Galingan and uh, uh, Mam Beth Espino, developed a metric for uh, assessment of all sidewalks uh, on a scale of one to five, depending on the uh, shade provided, uh, tree cover. Uh, status of the pavement, uh, presence of uh, curb cuts, and the like. And so from this uh, uh, point uh, assessment, uh, we developed one to five scale Legaspi and Salcedo village, villages in and Ayala Avenue in the late 90s, uh, rated from uh, uh, three to four. Uh, if we apply the same metrics to the rest of Manila, Manila would, would be about one or minus one. But still, uh, the, the uh, marching order was improved. Uh, pedestrian access, and so we did so in the last uh, 20 years as primary consultant uh, for urban design and landscape architecture uh, with, uh, with collaborations and some of the uh, overheads uh, with the Office of Leandro Loxin and Partners. Um, and in the last 20 years, uh, Masaya and Makati CBD has constructed 1.1 kilometers of elevated walkways, about two kilometers if you count the uh, walkway connections uh, through Makati Commercial Center to EDSA. There are 600 uh, meters of below grade or tunnels, uh, mostly through Ayala and Paseo de Roas. But there is uh, about seven uh, kilometers of improvements of sidewalks at grade, uh, of which 1.5 kilometers are covered. So over 650 million has been spent by Masaya over the last 20 years to improve connectivity in, in the district. And if you look at the uh, total amount, 650 is less than the cost of one of those skyscrapers to produce accessibility uh, that reduces dependency on cars and also uh, reduces, of course, uh, traffic. In uh, Ayala Avenue, which we were involved with in the last uh, seven years, uh, we, uh, we noted that the sidewalks had already been cracked. It's rather, uh, it's one of the widest sidewalks in the Philippines at five, about five, five meters across, uh, but we found that uh, a lot of the problems was uh, the original uh, acacias had already become stunted or died. The buildings are, uh, of course, much higher than uh, it was originally intended, so there's a little lack of sunlight. And the root systems uh, suffered because of the compaction from uh, hundreds of thousands of pedestrians pounding the pavement. The trees all, all, were also uh, in the middle uh, when uh, pedestrian traffic was very light. Of course, now it's uh, rather heavy. So the intervention is to correct all of the uh, these deficiencies, including the presence of about five different types of paving materials and patterns uh, to make it uh, smoother underfoot and to clear and increase the capacities of the sidewalk on both sides of Ayala Avenue. We planted, replanted uh, with shade trees, uh, native uh, data, and pushed uh, the planting birds to the edge, improved the lighting, and found the opportunity also to uh, replace all of the pavements with granite, which is the quality of surface that's found in Hong Kong and Singapore. And that also gave Masaya the opportunity to fix all of the utilities underneath and to improve the lighting for the sidewalk. And so we completed uh, Ayala Avenue, two kilometers on both sides, so that's four kilometers. And we've completed also now uh, most of the portions of Makati Avenue and Paseo de Rojas, while at the same time improving the sidewalks inside uh, Legazpi and Salcedo villages. 
the elevators were necessary for some of the spines because of the lack of capacity inside Legaspi and Salcedo village. If you recall, I, I, I noted that, uh, stated that uh, they originally were designed for residential densities. Uh, so the option had to be going up because uh, there was no way, way to expand uh, the sidewalk width. So it was a necessary cost, of course, ideally everything has at grade but the elevators also gave the opportunity for the newer buildings to connect to the second floor, as you find in uh, a lot in Hong Kong Central District and in some portions of Singapore. And this uh, leads to better connectivity and also to better commerce for those situated or located along those walks. One of the other things we found, uh, but because of the uh, preference of design for cars rather than for people, a lot of the road systems and uh, uh, intersections are designed for cars and not for people. Here you find Esteban Rovido streets uh, in the Gatsby village with a high speed curb for cars and a 60 meter distance to cross, which is not friendly to people, but friendly to cars. And so we propose that uh, uh, we, we construct bump outs, what we call bump outs, to reduce the distance pedestrians had to cross and to provide opportunities for this open space, which we eventually called urban patios. So this is from, from uh, above, the same intersection. And this is actual construction of the urban patio, which gave us uh, opportunities for additional open space and reduced the amount, uh, the width you had to cross without compromising the width, the two lanes, the two lane width that was required by the cars. So there's no compromise on the uh, access of the cars, but we have improved access for pedestrians with uh, speed tables to calm the traffic before they cross and better pavement plus additional space. For this, we won uh, an award from the Design Center Philippines last year for best place, place making intervention uh, with social implication. So we started with three uh, urban patios just about to complete six more and uh, we've, we're identifying other crossings like this in De La Rosa and Perea, same situation, the design and the implementation. So this has been very successful and this can be applied to a lot of our intersections and street corners because it is the same with most towns and cities in the Philippines where the, the bias is for cars and ra rather than for people. Everybody loves it. So over in the other uh, central business district, we're involved in the BGC Greenway, which is partly also a DOT RMRT link. Here we go. So the uh, proposal is to connect the Buendia MRT uh, parallel to going par right parallel to Kalayaan, entering uh, the BGC at the very corner and linking to the BGC Greenway, which uh, we did uh, originally in collaboration with uh, Criaris. Uh, and that would give pedestrians and a lot of the uh, tens of thousands of uh, commuters that uh, make up the staff of all of the business establishments in the BGC to gain access from Buendia. So uh, the first section is, of course, elevated because of problems, uh, long EDSA and uh, capacities that need to get us to the parallel Kalayaan connection. And this is the section designed by uh, the DOTR, uh, internal uh, staff, uh, but we, for which we were consulted uh, because of our experience with Makati and Ortiga CBD. And this is the... Uh, BGC Greenway, which is a disused power line of uh, Meralco, uh, which was now turned into uh, a parkway. Uh, the original designs uh, were by Crearis and ourselves uh, incorporating some of the rotondas into uh, open spaces. This is the uh, entrance uh, and hopefully now completed uh, and some of the nodes, there are three nodes that are provided and this is the design. And hopefully by next year, once uh, we get back to normal, you'll be able to see all of this. 
So the access is not just a parkway, but also opportunities for uh, additional open space, which uh, BGC of course needs. So uh, we have also proposed other intervention. This is unsolicited uh, to the government of Makati. Uh, this is uh, part of the problem we have with a lot of our uh, mass transit systems is the intermodal trans transfers. So we have a, a terrible lack of uh, good design. Once you get down the MRT or LRT at the street level and have to transition to other modes of uh, transport like jeeps or buses or tricycles. And here you can see it clearly on the right, the, the Guadalupe MRT and the, the transfers. You have to cross all the way down with the snow cover and very narrow sidewalks. Plus you have a large park uh, developed by uh, Mrs. Binay when she was mayor. Unfortunately, most people cannot access uh, this multi-million peso park. So, and very few can actually see it. So our proposal is, uh, of course, to connect uh, the MRT uh, to JP Rizal on both sides of the of JP Rizal, and it will also provide both uh, visual as well as physical access to the park itself, so everyone can benefit. I mean, the it it is the people's money that's spent for the park, so why uh, not give access to it? Hopefully, uh, the city government will take this project seriously. In Ortiga CBD, because of our experience with Makati, we were uh, pulled in by uh, Okai, which is the local uh, business establishment owners. But most of the interventions in Pasig is funded by the city of Pasig, with some, uh, at least one major project uh, being a DOTR ADB collaboration. Uh, in uh, 19, uh, 20, 2010, we were part of a group that studied the the problems of the CBT in terms of circulation, both vehicular and pedestrian, and we identified uh, a lot of uh, the problems, which at the time, which were the U-turns and the lack of capacities and connectivity uh, for pedestrians from EDSA into the uh, center of the B CBD and access to the offices. It took people, once they arrived in EDSA, uh, 20 to as much as 40 minutes to get to their offices because of this lack of connectivity. And, but the first big problem is, of course, this. As you get down from the MRT, there's almost no sidewalk. This is literally, you have to walk sideways in this sidewalk. So uh, the ADB sponsored the consultancy uh, uh, bid, which we won for uh, the Ortigas Greenway, which was to connect uh, the MRT MRT, that's an MRT, in direct, directly turning left into Opal and Onyx Road, connecting the very center of the CBD. Uh, the first section is, of course, above grade, but we go down below grade to Opal Road and at grade all the way uh, across to the um, Metrowalk connection, which is actually already built. So this is funded by uh, ADB. And the implementation is by DOTR. Unfortunately, because the cost of this was just over 300 million, I guess um, because it was so cheap, it was not put as a priority and we're still waiting for the funding from the OTR to implement this. And that's the reality that we face. A lot of the interventions uh, for pedestrian and non-motorized are very small in total amounts. And so uh, they get relegated to second priority when in fact they should be the first priority uh, in our infrastructure and build, build, build. Uh, there's a recent uh, proposal uh, for, for six uh, vehicular bridges across the Pasig when one bridge would actually fund about uh, 10 pedestrian bridges and that would improve access across the Pasig this is the uh, Ortigas Greenway. You see the uh, LRT here, MRT, and then you turn right. This is above grade, that's the MRT, that's uh, ADB's wall. And when you get down uh, across to uh, ADB and uh, towards Emerald, we use the space underneath for a hub, a bike hub, which is necessary if you want to push biking as a mode of transport. The problem is you get sweaty at the end of your, of your trip. So this provides uh, bikers, uh, showers and, uh, and lockers 
to store uh, their 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 bags in a, a secure place to lock their uh, bikes while they are at work, and you do the reverse before heading on home uh, from work at the end of the day. This is a fly through showing the uh, greenway. This is the elevated at uh, Robinson. And we had several stakeholder meetings where everyone was very excited, Poveda, because now the uh, parents can park in either in Mega Mall or uh, Robinson's and access the school. ADB, of course, uh, allowed that the walkway run parallel to its perimeter. Uh, the flight through was uh, made before SM agreed, but now SM, of course, has agreed to connect to this uh, walkway, which benefits them uh, very much. But uh, of course, now we'll have to see how it does in a post-COVID situation where there are less people. In any case, uh, pre-current and post-COVID in the new normal, we would need this uh, connectivity. And this is the ramp that comes down uh, to grade at ADB Avenue under which uh, we have our bike hub. And prior to the pandemic, we had already talked to a possible uh, locator uh, who would run a bike shop uh, as well as operate the uh, showers and the uh, locker system. And what has also come out of this is that we found space in Opal and Onyx Road to provide uh, small pocket parks to add to the existing one, which we actually uh, designed uh, about 15 years ago in the center of uh, Ortigas. And this uh, connects across to uh, across Emerald Avenue, which we also improved by widening the sidewalks to the other side uh, of the Central Business District, where we found another opportunity in Onyx Road for a uh, linear park and we've already talked to Robinson's uh, development and they're uh, very happy that they have this open space next to the their ground floor restaurants and open spaces close or adjacent to uh, restaurants is what we need in in uh, next year as we transition to normalcy but need to provide for social distancing so those open spaces will benefit a lot. Uh, for those of you in urban design, this is called the chicane, which also reduces the speed of uh, uh, vehicular traffic. So hopefully uh, uh, we realign our priorities uh, for build, build, build and get this done. So this is uh, the Ortigas Pocket Park, which we completed uh, 15 years ago. It's the most expensive park in the Philippines because it's 600 square meters. It's the most expensive real estate but it's a welcome amenity, especially today. And this is part of the uh, overhead uh, elevated system. And unfortunately, part of the elevated system because we did not get the cooperation of Mandaluyong, which is part of the, um, part of the area of the CBD cut short and we could not cross. So a lot of the problems for all of these interventions stem from political friction rather than anything that is rational. So hopefully we can address that problem, which is the largest systemic problem in the governance and management of our metro areas. So we also found that there were no open spaces uh, for plazas. So we suggested that a plaza be built above the intersection of Julio Vargas and Emerald. And the, the passing mayor, Mayor Isabel at the time, funded it and we built it. So this is the plaza. The center is actually an oculus, which provides for natural light in the intersection below. And on, in Christmas, hopefully this Christmas, there'll be a Christmas tree here. But this is a uh, welcome open space and much used by all of the passers-by, especially the staff of PGAA because our office is just one block away. So we also found that we could uh, uh, widen uh, the sidewalks uh, to the level of Ayala Avenue in Emerald Avenue by removing the center island and we, we by doing so, uh, the cars are not reduced in the number of lanes, but pedestrian uh, sidewalk is uh, extended by over 1.2 one meet, 1 meters on both sides. Uh, people have asked us why we didn't 
plant shade trees for one thing, the fiber optics underneath the sidewalks prevented us from planting anything with extensive root systems. Also, uh, most of uh, Emerald uh, is uh, in shade because of the orientation of the avenue and the presence of the streets. This is actually the only section that is still fully lit by the sun in the early and late afternoons because uh, the buildings had not been built yet, but most of Emerald is under shade. And of course, uh, Pasig has a one of the best uh, bike systems already implemented. It took a while for people, for motorists to get used to it, but of course now in a post-pandemic world, uh, we have to have uh, this bike lane and uh, ideally segregated. Nearby uh, in the University of Asia and Pacific, we were pulled in by a uh, group uh, that, in, that included uh, professors of the UAP, uh, of the UAP, in the uh, uh, school as well as uh, some of the building owners to address a big problem there which is the fact that uh, there's a group that operates the parking taking all of the uh, sidewalks and uh, what is actually not their property and turning them into uh, parking from, for which they uh, generate a lot of income and so there's a lot of uh, problems with accessibility for students, professors, and the general public, but it benefits just one operator of parking, which is a political thing. I'll not get into the, in, to, to the details of it, uh, but they're all around the uh, school, you have all of these problems of uh, narrow sidewalks and lack of access with the curb cuts and the parking. So uh, the proposal is to uh, take back the space from the cars. We found that if we spread the parking uh, for street parking all along the perimeter, we could actually fit more parking slots, which could be charged and still provide profit for the operator while turning back all of the space that they used to take uh, as pedestrian space. Also, uh, the group tried closing uh, the Pearl Drive and against, uh, again, against the objections of some of the uh, restaurant owners. But in fact, uh, the closures increased the pedestrian traffic and none of the restaurants lost any, any business uh, from the closure. So uh, this is, these are the proposals. These are the proposals for, for these are the proposals for Pearl Walk, which is uh, connectivity. This is from San Antonio Village. And uh, that's the start of Pearl Walk crossing to uh, the mid middle. Uh, this is the creek side beside the Meda, and this is an improvement. So the trick is to uh, design for people and not for cars to provide covered walkways, to provide the good paving underfoot, to uh, move. Uh, vehicles away from the sidewalk, which is not their territory really. And to ensure that every, everyone and every uh, establishment is connected for pedestrian with the cars uh, still able to use the streets for both uh, circulation and parking. So in uh, public publish, uh, in passing population, we were also asked to take a look at uh, the World Historic Core and improve accessibility and also actually conservation of some of the heritage sites. So we found the uh, Rizal Plaza with Rizal moved from his original position and he's pointing at uh, McDonald's because he always seems to be hungry. In fact, we found out from historical research that he was pointing at the church. And here we also have a prob uh, an opportunity in the museum uh, from which is was a donated uh, old mansion of a, a famous doctor in passing, but it's uh, uh, separated from the plaza by a street. So what we did, and this is the uh, as built showing Rizal. Rizal is uh, or was originally here, and there's a street that uh, separates the museum from from the plaza. So our proposal was to integrate the museum with Rizal, who is now being relocated back to his historical location. So uh, to show those in 
who are not uh, landscape architects that, uh, that park and plaza and open space design is actually rather technical. Uh, this is just a part of the whole package for uh, working drawings uh, for said plaza. So we built it, uh, funded by the Pasig city government. We integrated uh, the museum to the plaza. That we kept the spaces simple, the planting also uh, easy to maintain. McDonald's lease is not extended. And in fact, uh, we proposed that uh, Bonifacio, who is isolated in one street corner, be moved to that, and the mayor agreed. And so this is a Rupesal Plaza with the Pasig Museum. And we had other uh, sites and structures that needed to be integrated. McDonald's was not going to be extended. We had the Rio del Pasig, which was with structures, but a, a park is, uh, is uh, what would be uh, compatible with the area. And then we have the Pamantasan and Lusun and Pasig, where we were called in also to uh, fix up the campus because of the addition of a hospital and additional and, and uh, um, new Department. So we suggested a quadrangle plus connectivity with Rio del Pasig uh, linear park, and we transferred Bonifacio from his isolated uh, uh, intersection to a new plaza for himself, giving a balance between Bonifacio and Rizal with Pasig Museum in the middle. And this is the proposal showing uh, uh, the completed uh, Rizal Plaza. And this is actually already the completed Bonifacio. We have a linear park and we have a proposed overhead connection to uh, Pamandasan and Lusudam Passing, uh, where we also designed a quadrangle. So we actually completed it. This is the uh, two plus tandem plaza of uh, Rizal and uh, Bonifacio with the Passing uh, Museum in the middle. This is all pedestrianized. We have the linear park, the overhead connection to the uh, Pamantasan and Lusudran Pasig with its new uh, quadrangle, which is for people, but they use it for parking uh, some of the time. And we also did all of the uh, roof, roof uh, green roofs for uh, the two new buildings. So on the uh, other end of, uh, of, of uh, the Pasig uh, Civic uh, Core, we have this uh, city hall. And we found uh, a lot of uh, small buildings behind the city hall, which uh, could be removed because there was a lot of space in the city hall. We, we convinced the mayor to move it and uh, created a one hectare park uh, at the back of the city hall, which became, became very popular. Unfortunately, the, the late in the last administration, they felt they needed the space and they built the building with uh, plans, of course, to move the uh, the, uh, open space to the roof. Uh, speaking about roof, when we finished that park, we were asked by the city to build them another park. And we told the mayor, you don't have any more space, but you have 2,000 square meters on top of your city hall. We designed it as a green roof. We could not plant uh, shade trees because of the structural uh, limitations of the roof, which was already constructed. But we designed, we put in stretch membranes for shade and um, put in two view decks. And we actually built it. We used the uh, facade. Uh, this is the parapet of the front facade, which is now a stage. This is all uh, lawn now. That's Jerome Abad, our senior associate, just to prove that this is not a computer generated uh, perspective. And on one side, we put in uh, view deck so you can see the pollution in BGC. And on the other side, uh, another view deck so you can. Uh, see the pollution in Quezon City because uh, Pasig is the green city. And this is the uh, a, a drone shot of the uh, Panorama Park uh, on top of the city hall. This is the largest uh, green, green roof for a public uh, facility in the Philippines. One of the things uh, pre-current and post-pandemic that we have to fix is uh, is the fact that we don't know how to design plazas and monuments in plazas anymore. A uh, hundred years ago, we provided uh, proper settings for monuments and usually it's just one monument per plaza. 
uh, in the 1960s, they become they became little triangles, uh, mostly rotondas or intersections of streets. But today they're in the traffic islands, so we cannot um, honor our heroes anymore. I hope we don't honor our frontliners this way. And so we have to recover what really is uh, how we used to provide the settings for monuments. This was the last uh, public monument with any setting that was, was proportionate to it which is the Quezon Memorial uh, for President Quezon. It took 25 years to build, of course. But today we have things like this, which is uh, for uh, C.P. Garcia at the end of C.P. Garcia. Unfortunately, now it, it's, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I call this a matchstick monument because it looks like a matchstick. And it's rather awful. They ran, seem to have run out of uh, budget for the rest of the body. And it has a, uh, this pylon which is ridiculous uh, in terms of the quality and uh, but that's not all around it are eight more statues of uh, questionable aesthetic quality and um, this is Andres Monifacio but my caption for this is uh, is that you Andres or are you just happy to see me and these are the other uh, statues this this is uh, General Mac MacArthur if you can believe it and so we have to recover our uh, aesthetic sense. And unfortunately, also the plaques that they had in front of the statues uh, were actually uh, were actually just copied from old uh, NHCP plaques without any relation to the statues themselves. But the good thing is that I believe this this uh, because of the flyovers, uh, this has has uh, disappeared. But uh, we were called in to also fix uh, Ross Boulevard and we found a dozen statues of presidents and various other national figures hidden in all of the traffic. This is President Ross after which the, after whom the uh, Boulevard was named and we found him trying to uh, hail a cab, a taxi. So it's unfortunately, and uh, we also found Carlos Romolo hidden, not because he was small in real life, but uh, hidden amongst uh, uh, landscape that has uh, ra run rather wild and covered any any view of him. So we were asking the previous administration to uh, provide a design uh, for Baywalk. Uh, we are not involved with the current uh, beach, uh, but the the seawall was uh, destroyed during a storm surge, and uh, this is uh, after we completed it in uh, 2013. And the serration of the planters uh, is not a design affectation. It's actually part of, uh, of our design to assist in absorbing the, the energy of storm surges as it comes from, from the sea. But uh, this is one of the first uh, instances where we've been able to uh, integrate segregated uh, pedestrian and bike traffic. And in fact, our scope of work covered the other side and we found that the parking was not trashed uh, uh, needed to be rationalized. Uh, uh, the secretary of DPWH at the time wanted to put uh, a two level parking garage, but we told him that if we just rationalize the parking, and we did, we uh, increased the capacity by 20%, at the same time, still providing enough space for uh, adequate, well, uh, more than adequate pedestrian uh, sidewalks, and we did so. So this is before, this is after, showing the segregated. Unfortunately, again, if you improve uh, the urban design of cities, you also have to educate the citizens how to use them. For a while, a lot of motorcyclists were usurping this uh, road. So it's, it has to be a post-construction uh, effort to educate people how to use their newly uh, improved public spaces. And uh, Carlos Romolo, we provided all of the uh, statues with little piazzas uh, with paving that extended into a, uh, into a speed table. So the plaza is actually the entire area around it. And this uh, gave these statues more prominence. And th hopefully this is how we treat our heroes in the future. So at the end of uh, the two kilometers that we did for the Ross Boulevard improvement uh, is uh, the cultural center. And we were involved uh, with the ASEAN Plaza and CCP Esplanade in 1997, which was funded by Metro Bank. Uh, unfortunately, uh, their funding ended about here and the rest of the Esplanade was never constructed. But what we did construct of it was the ASEAN Plaza 
incorporating a sculpture of Ramon Orlina, which uh, was originally from the other side, and connecting to the esplanade at the side. This used, uh, uses the geometry uh, partly from the CCP driveway geometry, uh, and so the angles are aligned to it. This is the access, and this is the start of the esplanade, which is very popular with, with fishermen. And this is the other side. So unfortunately, it stops about here, uh, but it would be good if we were able to continue it. So uh, although this is not our project, uh, this is a project of the former mayor Lito Atienza Rizal Avenue pedestrianization uh, section uh, from, from um, uh, Binondo to, to uh, Tiem Recto. And because of this, uh, property values and uh, the mayor was able to convince uh, Meralco to bury all the lines, they repave them, pedestrianize the section. Uh, the buildings, uh, the owners themselves were, were encouraged to uh, fix up the facades. And for a while, the rental rates uh, went up. Everybody enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the, the pedestrianized area. The, the air was cleaner and there was more business. Plus the real estate values uh, uh, went up slightly. Of course, they're very high still. But unfortunately, when he lost the next election, this is uh, the next mayor, Mayor Lim, brought it back to the blighted uh, situation before the pedestrianization. So this is one of the things. It's politics again. So these are uh, unsolicited proposals uh, uh, by us to the city. We do have other uh, proposals which we've, we've uh, put together in a package, uh, which is still being considered by Mayor Isco. But this is one of the ones we would like to see happen, which is along the passing. And this for the Metropolitan Theater, which is again, if you see, it's mostly car oriented, but in fact, what could easily be done is to recover the space for pedestrians. And here along the Melie, Melie uh, the Balcon National, uh, parallel to Escolta, is, this is one of the proposals to uh, Mayor Isco or your Mayor Isco and hopefully it will be implemented but uh, there are other things with the stairs that can be done this is near the, the uh, Escolta and in a post-COVID uh, situation we need more open space for our restaurants to, to provide the social distancing Rizal Park we were involved in the previous administration in a new master plan for uh, the park and the historic core this is the existing development showing the 58 hectare Rizal Park. It's actually the only open space we have for the 12 million plus people that uh, is in Metro Manila. But we found another 60 hectares of, uh, of uh, green space, which is the golf course around Intramuro. So we proposed and it, it agreed in principle with the secretary of DOT and DPWH at the time that we redo it as a public park. So this doubles was supposed to double the area for Rizal Park into uh, about 100 hectares, which is about the size of the Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. And we propose connections to Escolta, Binondo, Santa Cruz, via pedestrian uh, bridges. And uh, this would uh, improve uh, the amount of open space, plus integrate all of the civil buildings and provide settings for the conservation of all of the structures in that site. Unfortunately, the one plus billion that we requested from government, uh, we reached the end of that administration and only 250 million was uh, allocated for some of the improvements that we put in for the result part. So this was supposed to have happened, improvement of the, uh, uh, the tree covered area, improvement of parking, the uh, integration of a future, um, High, higher density commercial district in the ports, uh, integration of Intramuros via pedestrian connect, connections to City Hall and to uh, the National Museum and to the park itself at this point and at the Aquino statues uh, corner. And uh, if you see at the back, these are the pedestrian bridges we suggested to connect Chiapo, uh, Santa Cruz and Binondo to Intramuros and to the park and to Ermita and Malate. So uh, this is the situation in Metro Manila. We have Rizal Park, 55, 58 hectares serving 12.8 million residents. 
while New York Central Park is 315 hectares, serving only 8.5 million residents, not counting the 2,000 plus other um, uh, square meters uh, uh, of uh, park system in the five boroughs of New York, all connected by transit. So we are far, uh, far, uh, in a way, lacking in open spaces proportion to to uh, built up area in Singapore. Singapore has 101 gardens by the bay plus 60 hectares in Fort Canning. Plus again, another uh, uh, 250 parks in all over single Singapore serving only 5.7 million people. So this is a comparative uh, uh, chart showing open space for, for select cities, Manila and Metro Cebu at the bottom. Singapore has uh, 230 parks, I'm, I correct myself, uh, 2,500 hectares total, or, uh, which gives us uh, 5.78 square meters of public parks and open space per person in Singapore compared to Manila, which has only 200 hectares. Uh, cumulatively in all 16 cities and one town, the, uh, uh, the La Mesa watershed cannot be counted because it cannot be used as a public park because of limitations to public intrusion for a watershed. So we only have uh, 200 hectares and that gives us only 0.2 square meters public parks and open space per person in Metro Manila. Met Crosibo is even less at 0.1. So Singapore has 20 times more parks and open space than Metro Manila and 40 times more than Cebu. So we have to correct this. And this is the situation where you can't find open space except for Rizal Park uh, and the uh, golf course that's used only by, by uh, 200 regular golfers against the 12 million that actually need the space. Of course, the next largest area would be Malacanang Park, which is only used by the president and the, uh, and the president and security guard and the Pandakan, which uh, I understand, uh, Pandakan area, which I understand um, it has been redesigned with some public open space, but it is a brownfield redevelopment and the toxicity of the site will take uh, a decade or more to, to, to um, mediate, remediate. So we have uh, five hectares of the uh, uh, zoo here, uh, plus two hectares of the CCP uh, park, uh, which has not been given funds for development as a park. And the zoo is, I believe, now being redeveloped. So Metro Cebu, 2.8 million. So we need to recover space and build infrastructure for alternative modes of transportation to prepare for future epidemics. We need that open space aside from the accessibility uh, because uh, in, in, in an earthquake or calamities, we need the open space as refuge areas for triage tent cities. And as a relief uh, from the the effects of all of our isolation, as you all are very well aware of. In Quezon City, we have a proposal for pedestrianization of uh, Aurora Katipunan uh, connection. Um, this is the situation in uh, Katipunan. On one side, there's no parking because of uh, allowing all of the business owners to allow continuous curb cut. That means they are cutting the curbs, which is on the pedestrian sidewalk to allow uh, cars to park perpendicular to the road, which is not uh, not uh, allowable in any other uh, sane city in the world, but we allow it here. That means we negate all of uh, the sidewalks in for the benefit of cars. So we did a number of studies for several options. Uh, the first, of course, is to uh, bring back all of the sidewalks and force the building owners to provide for parking elsewhere. And uh, we also found that the lanes provided on Katipunan are between 3.3 3 .3 to 3.7, almost 4 meters, when in fact it could be reduced, thus uh, improving the possibility for uh, sidewalks and road. And this is uh, this section of the option for uh, upgrade, which is the most ideal, but politically the most difficult because you would have to deal with all of the objections from the business owners. So this is the proposal. This is the most ideal proposal with, with a bike lane, uh, an expanded sidewalk uh, covered with uh, in, in a lot of the instances because of the lack of arcades or weather protection. 
but unfortunately, we had to look at other uh, possibilities or interventions that uh, needed an elevated uh, walkway. And we, what we've done to improve the situation also is to provide for enough width to allow for scooters or bikes at the upper level. So we ran uh, three more options in various combinations that allowed some parking underneath or, li or limited parking underneath with possibilities of also segregated uh, bike lanes. So this is the flight room. We also analyzed that Katipunan from uh, uh, before and after Aurora had various uh, number of lanes, uh, which is actually only eight lanes uh, for both sides. And this is the Aurora Boulevard connection, which is a problem because once you get down from the uh, uh, MRT, it's hard to cross. So crossing is necessary as an elevated, even to the first turn to the uh, left uh, to get to the start of Katipunan. Uh, ideally, we would get down to grade level here, but because of the political uh, problems of having to deal with all of the business owners, uh, an elevated, uh, this is not the ideal, but this is one of the options is to bring uh, uh, bike and pedestrian traffic above grade, but still providing a uh, possible uh, segregated bike lane at the bottom. So scooters and bikes uh, in, an, in a wide uh, elevated uh, walkway, which is uh, four, four plus meters. And at the end, uh, connecting so connecting all of the uh, universities, the, the Miriam, UP, and Ateneo, and at the end also providing a connection to uh, to uh, uh, the Ayala Mall, and a proper connection, a possibility of also uh, giving the corner of UP a, a, a better entry statement. So we get to U UP Diliman campus, and since uh, most of you are students uh, of the of the lab, uh, this is something. This is the question you have to ask: Is uh, UP Diliman campus really uh, pedestrian friendly? Uh, today it is not because of the of the policy of the university in the last uh, 30 years to uh, in introduce sprawl into the campus by segregating all of the departments, including the College of Architecture farther and farther away from the central core. So uh, you are now an average of one to 1.5 kilometers uh, from the edge or from the edge uh, departments to the center of uh, the university. Each with uh, its own driveways, parkings and utilities, which could be reduced. So the carbon footprint of the university has increased in the last 30 years because of the policy, but originally this is the 1941 UP Diliman master plan showing that all of the units were supposed to be ar arranged within two, 200 meters of each other around the university course. It was a walkable campus that uh, sh we should have followed as a general strategy for its development. And uh, originally in 1941, it was surrounded by 1000 hectares of open space, which could be, which was intended as a, as a park for the surrounding areas, of course, Unfortunately, today we are down to 493 of which about uh, one third is already given uh, away to commercial development and or informal settlers. So uh, over the past four years, I've uh, proposed some uh, 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 propo proposed some uh, interventions like this in Vargas to be able to bring back um, the ped pedestrian orientation of our buildings, which was uh, the original um, a direction that uh, the older buildings had, like uh, Melchor and Palma Halls. This is Vargas, which is uh, designed really uh, are accessed by the car, but you can bring back the pedestrian um, orientation this way. Then you have Vincent Hall, which is a students' union, but again, it is 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 uh, uh, prioritizing uh, cars and parking when it could be better uh, by providing uh, for. Uh, plazas for people and the org uh, plus a quadrangle for orgs, which I propose to be named up after Leon Alejandro. Parking can be at the rear, there's more than enough space. And this is how it could lo look like. This is a, a quick excuse on my part and a proposal uh, to the university. 
and the other area we we were supposed to have been moved to the old uh, to the old uh, engineering tennis court that was the allocation in the 1970s but unfortunately we missed that up window of opportunity but we have uh, the film center the university university theater and uh, the college of music and much come here when in fact we uh, we could have had an integrated uh, quadrant that housed all the uh, uh, arts and design um, departments and, and we could have been here uh, with uh, fine arts, with the uh, film center, with the theater, with the College of Music and connected also the MASCOM. So this would have uh, led to uh, synergies uh, and, and, uh, and not have to duplicate uh, uh, facilities for parking and utilities. And, uh, but most importantly, we would have had uh, the, the created settings where students from various disciplines would uh, meet other students from other disciplines and gain from the intellectual exchanges and discourse, which is the intent of all universities and college. Yet we, our strategy in the university has, has been to segregate us. So we become very isolated, just like in this pandemic. And that isolation has led to a decline in, I believe, I strongly believe the, the, um, the uh, intellectual discourse that the university is supposed to provide. So this is the Gonzalez Hall main library. Of course, now I, I understand this is being being built uh, as a plaza in front. I'm not uh, aware of the actual design, but uh, what could be um, extend what it could be extended for a whole net network of connectivity to bring both sides together, which I proposed this way. And originally, uh, the lagoon was proposed in 1941. We've never built it. So that's my take on UP, but the most uh, successful um, projects have been in Iloilo, a secondary city. Of course, it's much smaller than Metro Manila and not saddled with the lack of political will. Um, in fact, it has one political will. The problem with Metro Manila, it, it has 17 political wills. But in Iloilo City, uh, uh, eight years ago, Senator Rodon brought us to the dike road that had been built to, to uh, address some of the flooding problems. and. Um, the road was actually not required for for the uh, city traffic and was used as a uh, place for for recreation but it was very unfriendly so the um, senator asked us to design an esplanade um, having seen some of the work we did in singapore we did the design in two months we had three stakeholder meetings we got comments we incorporated the comments in the design and we actually built it in eight months so uh, this was using funds channeled through the, from the senator to the city, and it was uh, implemented by DPWH, who we had to go, uh, go through seminars with to, to orient them how to design for people and not for cars. Not perfect, but uh, the most successful of any of our uh, collaborations with the DPWH, the biggest um, one of the biggest things that come out from the, came out from the FNA, this is phase one, 1 1.2 uh, kilometers built at the cost of just under 70 million pesos, is the fact that the price of property uh, before we did the Esplanade uh, was five to 6,000 pesos per square meter. Now it's 20 to 30,000 pesos per square meter, proving the point that if you improve the public realm or if you invest in, um, in pedestrian and public infrastructure, the, uh, the, the profits accrue not just to those who use it, but also to property owners. And of course, uh, that is more taxes for the, for the city. So this is uh, Esplanade 2, and we won two uh, awards for this. At night, you can take a boat. And uh, we're now in phase one, nine, which would give a total of five kilometers, which is the longest uh, uh, waterside uh, linear park. Uh, and uh, eventually it will top out at about eight kilometers. So the uh, improvements for the Esplanade has spawned the uh, uh, general urban renewal in, in um, Iloilo city. And we've been lucky to get involved in uh, uh, a lot of them, not all of them, some of the other interventions in the city uh, is, as regards for uh, the business uh, and heritage district were done by by concept under Dinker and Sidel and his group. Uh, we've also, but we've also come uh, and collaborated with local architects like Architect Isancha for the provincial capital. 
uh, grounds, um, and we just completed the conservation master plan for the heritage core of Iloilo. That's phase five. Uh, we're providing boardwalks through the mangroves, which has come back because uh, the informal settlers have been moved uh, to relocation sites nearby. And so all of this is now connected. Um, this this uh, video was done uh, four years ago. We're now completed the provincial capital, which is shown here. It's five hectares. This is our proposal, and we'll show you how it looks like today. This is very close to how we envisioned it in this slide through. The old uh, jail, which is 100 years old, has now been converted into the a satellite for the National Museum. This was designed by architect Isan Shah, former president of the UAP. And it's connected at the back to the Esplanade uh, Phase 8, I believe. So uh, this is five hectares of the provincial uh, grounds, uh, which is now connected to the uh, Esplanade. But we found other opportunities for recovery of public space that further down uh, into the center of old Iloilo. And, that in, and we found an old um, Sunburst Park, which had a grandstand used only once a year. So the decision was made to move the grandstand to the new Esplanade side, recovering a large open space that's a grandstand. And we found two uh, forgotten heroes um a, a local general and uh, a british guy who in, introduced uh, sugar sugar um, centrals to the area mr loney surrounded by informal settlers uh, but this is the uh, proposed uh, site development for the civic center uh, bringing back the open space of sunburst plaza and improving uh, plaza libertad on the right uh, so the Bureau of Customs, which is over 100 years old, has been uh, fixed up or is being fixed up by funds with funds from Chiesa. The grandson has been relocated, the existing DTI, the existing El Salde building has been adaptively reused as the Economic Museum of Iloilo, and we are currently do redoing the Plaza Libertad. And this is how it uh, is, is what's envisioned. Of course, uh, we'll show you how it looks today. So this is the uh, Sunburst uh, Plaza. Uh, the fountain, unfortunately, has not been built yet. It was supposed to be a donation of Mega World, where uh, the city is still waiting for the funds. Uh, the statues uh, of the uh, Ilongo uh, General um, and uh, Mr. Loney has been uh, recovered, and we're providing hopefully a new place also for Mr. Loney at the back uh, by the Esplanade. So this is uh, the uh, provincial capital now fixed up. We've rationalized the parking to improve its capacity by about 15%. We have provided a front area which was uh, covered. Uh, this this uh, Iloilo Museum by architect and landscape architect Serge Penesales has been uh, conserved and is now again given a prominence because of the setting that we've designed for it. And this is on the other side and we recovered a park which was originally built by uh, I believe the lions, uh, and this is the Rotary Park. So we brought bo both of them back from uh, a blighted situation. There was a Department of Tourism building here, which was nondescript, and we convinced them the the may uh, the governor to move it to the original uh, old provincial capital here at the corner, which has been conserved. This is the jail, and so this is Star Sunburst Plaza. As you see it, it's been uh, redone as. As uh, we envision, the new grandstand is here. We also found other areas uh, in, in Iloilo that could uh, be recovered. We proposed this already to the city, and hopefully, it will be this intervention can be constructed. We found again uh, this, this uh, 60 meter walkway across this wide expanse of asphalt in Pasolatagai, which is a central node in the city. The intersection is not used anymore because of traffic rerouting. So, all of this space is underutilized, but you have to walk the 60, 60 meters across. And this is our proposal to be able to create a public space. If you notice, uh, of course, the, there's a new billboard ordinance. So all of these uh, billboards are now gone. Uh, and uh, the part of the incentives is also for the uh, heritage building owners to improve their facades and they're starting to do so. In fact, they already have from from uh, Iloilo Ilo as one of the oldest uh, uh, heritage conservation or, uh, ordinances. It's, it's already been effect, in effect for a decade and we've seen a lot of the heritage buildings conserved and what is needed 
is better or urban design and connectivity, which we're hoping to provide by interventions like this. It has not, not only have we uh, uh, looked at uh, the city, but also the connectivity of the city to the airport and the outlying, outlying boroughs or, or, or uh, towns all the way up to Santa Barbara. And we convinced uh, the DPWH to give 40% of the road right away for pedestrians and bikers. We designed it as a linear park. And we actually built it. This was uh, taken uh, right after completion, uh, close to five years ago. This is how it looked at the opening, um, uh, but of course, this is how it looks it looks uh, during bike day. Bike ridership in in Iloilo before the pandemic uh, already uh, boomed uh, sev several hundred times, uh, uh, and and uh, there are now over a dozen uh, bike shops in the central area here. Uh, so people had already started to ship the bikes, but now in the pandemic, Iloilo is one of the most repaired in terms of uh, transportation using uh, 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 non-motorized uh, means. And so everybody is able to get around uh, uh, Iloilo by bike. This is the bike network. This is the university loop, which connects several universities. This is uh, Aquino Avenue, which we showed you before. And this is uh, part of the Esplanade network and uh, slowly intervention, additional interventions pushed by the bikers themselves in terms of things like bike racks and segregation from traffic lanes are already now being implemented. And Ilo, Ilo is the place to look for for all of these interventions where we, we uh, are, are pleased that we are uh, part of the original interventions, but we have to give a credit to uh, the users of the of the network that had sought to uh, to push for further improvements uh, like this bike racks, uh, which uh, are, have been the first fifty were uh, given to various artists of uh, Iloilo, and they all they're all distinct, and they're now already put in about fifty places uh, all around the city. So the Iloilo bike network is one of the best. Um, it's the best in the country and it, it's something to emulate. So that's the end of, of my presentation. And uh, the, the, the first step to any, uh, the, 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 any journey starts with the first step. So uh, let's take that first step and walk the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the informative talk, uh, Sir Paolo. So now we will proceed to the uh, open forum. We actually already have received a few reactions and questions. So now I will uh, read uh, the first reaction and a related question. So the government should make our streets walkable, free from obstructions uh, such as people, structure, structures, and trash, and not just be an afterthought. Um, a related question would be, it seems that planning and implementing walkability needs funding. What are your recommendations on how to implement walkability projects on a tight budget or with no budget at all? Well, for one thing, the, let me address that. I've, I've already forgotten what the first question was. But in terms of budget, uh, the cost of uh, infrastructure for pedestrians and non-motorized transport is minuscule compared to what the, the trillions being spent for vehicular trans transport. The, the cost of a lot of the walkway systems uh, you see is, is uh, for the whole Iloilo it would be the cost of about only one kilometer of Skyway. Uh, the cost of a pedestrian bridge is uh, 120 at that of a B, uh, one, 120 to 130 at that of a vehicular uh, bridge if it crosses a body of water and, and uh, uh, also less, very much less than, uh, than any of the, the overpasses we have now. Um, the cost of pedestrian improvement of uh, uh, 650 million in the central business district of uh, Makati is less than the cost of one building. Uh, and that improves uh, circulation. So the investment is justified. The, there is already a lot of money available uh, through the B, DBM Green 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 program. Unfortunately, the proponent of that program, uh, Juno and Bria, is and uh, uh, has uh, is not in the country anymore, and and uh, the the uh, program seems to be losing steam. Hopefully, they will continue it. Uh, but uh, several billion have been allocated uh, for all of the 145 cities 
of the Philippines and uh, depending on the size of the city, uh, you can get up to 50 or 60 million with most of the cities getting uh, tens of millions of pesos for improvements uh, for open space and uh, pedestrian access. So again, it's not a matter of uh, funding. The funding is there. It's the priority that we prioritization that we don't have. I was in a previous uh, seminar and we looked at the trillions being spent uh, on, on this very large infrastructure like subways, uh, which ha has a gestation of, uh, of decades and won't be in full, full uh, uh, efficacy until maybe 15 years from now. When in fact, if we want to address some of the immediate concerns of the pandemic is to, to put segregated bike lanes using, using just a few hundred million for the entire uh, Metro Manila. It's really not a lack of funds, it's the lack of will and um, the, the uh, rock, rock solid mindset that still uh, looks at that uh, traffic and cars. Uh, what was the first question, uh, Joyce? Uh, sir, it's more of just a comment uh, that the walkable uh, uh, streets being walkable should be um, a priority and just not an afterthought. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, but, well, the problem is also the, uh, the building codes that have uh, created the 1.2 minimum uh, sidewalk widths in most of our city. Have been uh, were made uh, uh, over half a century ago when densities in a lot of these areas were very low. You had densities of uh, with FARs of one, one to two, uh, one or two story, one to four stories only, and and so the width of the sidewalks didn't have to be that wide. When ideally your the sidewalk width, just like in Ayala, being five meters, is dependent on the heights and uh, uh, FAR density, densities of uh, of the building plots beside it. That's rational. Either that or you do as uh, what BGC has done is to incorporate arcades into the ground floors of the buildings, which is very good if you can police the arcades to be free from vendors, which was uh, 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 Vanilla's deficiency in, in policing the uh, open space for pedestrians and allowing all the vendors in, in those arcades. If you remove all the vendors in the arcades in, in Old Manila and CM Recto and the adjoining streets, you would improve. Uh, pedestrian circulation, but it's a political issue and it's a graft and corruption issue of the, the payments that this vendor makes to whoever are getting all of those profits. It's politics. Next question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So next question would be, what do you think are the main implications of the pandemic scenario on road ne networks? Right now, Ayala Avenue has dedicated its outer lanes to bikes there are fewer pedestrians compared to the pre-pandemic crowd, and buses have again started to compete for passengers along uh, the reduced Ayala motors, motorized vehicle carriageway. Well, uh, post-COVID, yes? Yeah? Uh, yes, yes. What should we be preparing for uh, in terms of road network improvements mid-pandemic and going towards the future? Well, right now is 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 uh, quick interventions to allow to allow uh, to allow for segregated bike lanes because a lot of our our workers uh, that's the only option, and if we provide uh, safe segregated uh, bikeways to the entire metro area, then you would see uh, our economies uh, get boosted back. The government could do a lot of things. It could do that. It could subsidize uh, the bikes themselves. I mean, bring them in tax free distribute it for free. What's the cost? The cost of a thousand bikes is less than the cost of, of one SUV that uh, our politicians use. If, if we did that, we could provide almost everyone with bikes and reconfigure our, uh, our streets until, uh, until, uh, post, post, uh, until we get the vaccine to allow for these uh, this bikes. Uh, the problem of the buses is a problem that even pre-pandemic is, is the problem of the lobbies of the operators of the bikes who are against the BRT system, which could be implemented also to augment some of the primary routes of uh, the, the MRT, LRT system, which themselves are inefficient because you have four different uh, LRT, MR systems are not compatible with each other. And there's a very obvious lack of uh, intermodal connectivity. So it's a problem of this uh, 
uh, urban lack of urban design uh, intervention. It's a lack of space. It's a lack of uh, mindset that looks at the problem as as a larger whole uh, rather than a sectoral thing. The problem of uh, uh, in the in the longer future, in the longer outlook of a uh, of a post pandemic um, Metro Manila or other metro uh, area in the Philippines is is really the lack of comprehensive land use planning from which a transport plan has to come in. You have to, it's land use first, and then it's infrastructure to support it. Instead of what we're doing now in all of our metro regions, the 17 LGUs in Metro Manila, the six in Cebu, and a, num a number of course in Metro Baguio and Metro Davao, that are, all pl are planning independently of each other with very little co collaboration. So uh, there is no way I believe uh, even in the current pandemic to solve all of the issues of Metro Manila unless it is under a metro cooperation thing, which used to be provided by the Metro Manila Authority, but of course now that's been devolved into the 16 cities and one town. Nobody's talking to each other. Everybody wants to do their own thing, believing falsely, much like Trump, in, in, in that they can solve things uh, within their own uh, sphere of influence when in fact all of the problems that beset uh, our cities are tied together. It's, it's all in a synergy that, that uh, cannot be addressed unless we look at the overall picture and work as one. We're all together here. And transport is uh, one of the biggest problems. Next question. Uh, next question would be, what challenges did you encounter during the, the project implementation? Was there a difference between government and private corporate projects? Actually, they're the same. Uh, the, like it, with, with the, the Masaya projects in uh, Ortiga CBD, it's stakeholder engagement, just like with the public, it's stakeholder engagement. And a lot of the groups uh, in the stakeholder, a lot of the stakeholder groups are, are from the elite or for the bosses, you know, a lot of them don't use cars. So, we, so when we propose uh, street closures or pedestrianization, uh, the, the main complaints were always, oh, we can't, we can't stop here, we can't park here, we, we can't, uh, where will our cars go? Uh, and, but they don't put themselves in the shoes of 90% of the users of their areas who are commuters and pedestrians. And so we had a, a we had to engage them and convince uh, the stakeholders. Uh, the associations uh, had a big hand uh, in, in doing this uh, Masaya, Oka, and Lijiseya. Uh, but uh, a lot of the building owners really can't get beyond their mindset of uh, uh, everything uh, catering to their own elitist concerns. And so, you know, um, uh, it was very hard to convince people. Um, so it's, you know, it's hard to convince uh, people uh, what a camel looks like. If you haven't seen a camel and one, what comes out is an elephant. So uh, the only, the best way to prove something is to build it. And uh, that's what we hope Iloilo can provide is a proof concept to show that it can be done here in the Philippines. It can be done within a, a minuscule budget and it, 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 it can be done tomorrow. I mean, uh, eight months is uh, what we took to uh, do um, well one year for first and second phase and uh, we have one year until the vaccine is distributed nationwide we we can put in the segregated uh, bikeways in almost all of our cities now if we had the political will to do so next okay. question um well that question was from sharon ramosa this next question will be from ralph sotoridona um, how do the locals utilize the public spaces in city of Manila? Was it solely used initially for pedestrian access or were there other forms of usage that emerged through the years? Then there's a next question um, I will give later. Can you repeat that again? What was the previous use? Uh, yes, was it solely initially used for pedestrian access uh, and there were, and, or were there other forms of usage that emerged through the years? Well, sidewalks uh, had always been there. I mean, uh, uh, since since the since the Spanish era, or at least the late Spanish era, most of the settlements had spaces allocated for for people. Of course, there were a lot of vendors that used them, 
and uh, paving uh, came sporadically, uh, mostly only in Intramuros itself and eventually in the Arabales or the towns, uh, five towns surrounding uh, Manila. Uh, paved, paved sidewalks and improvements to sidewalks came mostly in the American period as drainage and sewer systems were put in and that led to also the development of, of uh, the sidewalk system in Manila, uh, which at the turn of the century was only 250,000 people. And so the, the need for uh, more uh, public infrastructure in terms of uh, pedestrians uh, came in only uh, when, when populations grew. Of course, uh, until the war, we had a very efficient tranvia system or tram system that uh, at its peak carried 7 million passengers a year. So we didn't have uh, the traffic from cars and vehicles, which were prohibitively cost at, uh, uh, expensive at the time. And so most people walked and most people uh, took, the, do, took the trams. Eventually, of course, uh, because plan, the plans of the, of the, the, the master plans were not followed, uh, we, we lost control over land use and uh, infrastructure development uh, lagged behind and eventually in, in the independence era because of the fractured na nature of our governance and again graphic, uh, uh, and corruption in politics led to uh, the abandoning of any, any uh, following of uh, master plans or infrastructure development that was rational, so it's all irrational because of politics. Yes, what's the follow-up question? Uh, do you think the public spaces in the city of Manila contribute to the heritage tourism potential of the city by other forms of usage? I mean, were they utilized for economic purposes? Yes, of course. A lot of the spaces, the, parks, uh, the plazas were also places for interim uh, or uh, uh, seasonal uh, markets. You had multi-use aside, aside, aside from social events. We have to realize that tourism won't come back for another three, four, five years. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we abandon uh, the recovery and, and the enhancement of such uh, spaces or the building of new ones because we need public open space even without the pandemic because of the nature of, uh, of the bad densities that we are prone to, to, to put into our cities. We don't have that balance. There is no law that requires cities except for subdivisions there is no law that requires a balance of open space to build up areas there is just no law um, uh, for this balance that is required uh, by us now especially in a uh, post pandemic and in pre preparation of future pandemics now onwards we have okay. to do it. Uh, next question would be what uh, from jovan rona what do you do when your projects from previous administra administrations gets omitted uh, or changed because of the current administration? Do you not step in and talk with the current administration? Yes, we could, but mostly we just go on Facebook and Twitter. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, social media has been very uh, uh, good to be able to uh, spread the gospel of, of uh, public open space and parks and uh, uh, communication is key in, in letting uh, your message get out there. And that message is a necessary message and it has to be communicated. The more people are aware of what they could, that what they need and what they could benefit from, then they will exert uh, pressures on, on the officials. Uh, it's very hard to deal with a lot of politicians whose agendas are limited by their three year terms or agendas connected to uh, all of the darker side of uh, politics that we have in, in the Philippines. Uh, sidewalk vendors are part of our urban culture. What can we do to integrate them but still improve pedestrian space? Yes, uh, we, we can go by the experience of Hong Kong and Singapore, which had riots because uh, the authorities 100 years ago were forcing the vendors out, uh, but not providing for alternatives. So there, there were uh, what, they, what they call the five footway riots in, in, in Singapore because the arcades were being cleared of vendors. Um, and the problems were not addressed, uh, addressed until uh, Lee Kuan Yew's time when uh, to, to, uh, to address the situation, he built hawker centers and uh, good public markets with allocations for all of these vendors. 
who now are, in, are found in this more sanitary and uh, better settings. Uh, so, so they benefited from all of this. So again, it is, uh, and, and, and to a certain extent, Hong Kong did the same thing. So if you put, identify the need and put the infrastructure before you uh, kick people out, then uh, you cannot be blamed for kicking them out and not providing for uh, for for uh, um, this culture of, of street food. This, the a lot of the street food uh, and the hawker centers are beside the street, and and you continue. But then you also provide for the spaces need by pedestrians, which are the rest of all of us uh, who need to get from one place to the other. Why why should vendors have the right to this? to the space that is needed for circulation. We have rights to, it's not just the rights of the vendors, but if you look behind the scenes, it's the rights of those who collect the tongue from the vendors, which is the problem in a lot of our cities. It's really graft and corruption. It's really politics and it's really uh, the public that is not engaged because they don't, uh, not uh, shown better. Okay, next question will be, what is the proper design approach for establishing bike lane and walkways if the main problem is the improper, allocate, improper locations of parking and loading uh, areas for PUVs that block sidewalks? This is all part of a much more complex problem of, uh, of our transport system not being comprehensively planned against land use. So jeepneys are an, uh, as, are a uh, uh, improvised solution to when for when the tranvias disappeared uh, from the streets of uh, Manila, and because it, it became so successful, quote unquote, in Manila, it was copied all over the place. When in fact we did have um, real based uh, transport systems uh, even in Cebu and other cities uh, before the war, and and uh, that. Uh, along with other problems of the lack of uh, of land use that allows for laybys for uh, a vehicular uh, tra uh, transit stops uh, is is part of the problem. So you really have to start with land use, then you put a uh, comprehensive uh, several tiered uh, public transport system, then you get down to uh, urban design that uh, allows all the spaces needed for both pedestrian and vehicular transport. The hardest thing to solve is if you, on the other end, when all of these problems have accumulated and something you cannot ever solve. So a lot of the problems we see in Manila cannot ever be solved. We have to retrofit the entire metropolis, starting with the political fra and governance framework before we can address all of the physical. But the physical itself can be designed. It's then a problem of, the biggest problem is of property rights of building and lot owners who do not want to give up uh, space from their defined properties for public use. So uh, uh, the principle of uh, eminent domain, which is used in Singapore and Malaysia and, and, and Hong Kong and cities to get spaces needed for all of this infrastructure cannot be implemented here because the, all the landowners are very good lawyers and you're in the courts for 20 years. Like the connection from EDSA to Ross Boulevard took 30 years before they could punch through. And that was true a lot. That was, there's too much energy involved uh, and the trans transactional costs are too much. So unless we own all of the land, as Singapore did at the start when they took Lee Kuan Yew, uh, took over, all eminent domain is implemented as in Hong Kong, then there is no hope of fixing everything. It's just too complex. And I don't want to give false hope to people looking at this and saying, oh, it can be solved. Yes, we can solve some of the problem, but unless we understand the complexity of the whole situation, and we have the capacity to understand that complexity. We do. We cannot address that complexity. Okay, um, we're down to the last two questions. So the Tagalog word is masalimuot. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so we're down to the last two questions. The first one would be, uh, what could be the reason behind the Philippines being car friendly and not pedestrian friendly? 
it's a car lobby. It's, a, it's the people making the cars, pushing cars. It's the people who want more roads and, and uh, selling us the concrete. It's the lobby. It's, it's uh, the agenda of, of uh, its vested interest and the, uh, against the interest of everyone, everyone else. So this goes back again to civic, uh, civic spirit and, and, uh, and politics, unless we have a citizenry who know their rights and who can fight the agenda of, uh, of, uh, of everyone else. I mean, let, let's not get too into any uh, discussions of, of, on neoliberalism. But the, yes, we need to uh, assert our rights as citizens and uh, force government uh, to provide all of the basic needs that we that we are supposedly assured of by our constitution, and uh, even beyond uh, uh, pedestrian connectivity, you have to start, uh, especially in in the post pandemic situation. You have to start with the basics, which is housing, hospitals, and um, the economy. Uh, a lot of the problems of transition of the uh, pandemic is because of bad densities we have because of informal housing and uh, very bad uh, urban design and um, public trans well public transport that's that's uh, controversial you can provide for public transport but housing uh, our backlog is uh, six million housing units that means we have to build six times uh, what Singapore built in the last 50 years tomorrow just to catch up. Again, we cannot dumb down or, or uh, make small the problem that we are facing. If we have a war of drugs, the war should be not the war on drugs, but the war uh, to provide housing. And our hospitals, uh, tertiary hospitals are inadequate. We will need this in any calamity that we are faced, yet we still have to go to PGH in the center of traffic invested Manila to be able to get uh, uh, our medical needs. The needs uh, in all cities, again, aside from open space, we have to have allocations for public uh, affordable housing as well as public hospital system. Uh, okay, sir. Then for our last question, um, I just want to ask your thoughts on how landscape architecture and urban design can be incorporated with social distancing measures in a post-pandemic setting? Would it be possible to design such spaces as public open spaces are designed to bring people together? Uh, thank you. It's actually very simple. Uh, our requirements, uh, which can be met by good uh, landscape architectural and urban design, uh, our requirements are there even, even pre-COVID. Even pre-COVID, all of our cities lack open space. Uh, even pre-COVID, we, we don't have enough uh, uh, street connectivity and pedestrian networks. So no matter what, COVID or no, no COVID, pandemic or no pandemic, we would really need to shift our priorities in, in, in what the government spends money on. And we need to relook re the way we, we uh, design our cities so they're greener. For those of you more current, it's more biophilic. Uh, we, we have to uh, uh, bring back the balance, which is essential in any uh, efforts for sustainability. So SDG goals can only benefit even, we don't have to think of the COVID to know that we are deficient in all of the goals that, uh, that are supposed to be set. And so our task, uh, the 500 plus of us is uh, actually huge. And uh, we have to start uh, yesterday to, to contribute. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. So um, we have more questions, but we will just send it to um, our speaker and we'll find ways to facilitate uh, the answers. So um, yes, right now um, our uh, discussion, our uh, session has ended. Um, yes, just to, just to close the talk, um, cities are resilient. Uh, innovators, including designers, and citizens allow this adaptation to happen. Today, we have learned that opportunities in creating public and open spaces and creating opportunities to move more people and not cars can be found not only in large but also in smaller scales. So um, thank you so much for all our attendees and for the active participation of 
um, the um, attendees. Um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, thank you, and keep safe, everyone. Uh, thank you, Architect Al uh, Alcazar, and we appreciate your talk very much. And hopefully, next time again. <laughs> 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 <laughs>